honored to introduce our first panel, Conversations with Cabrera. Our president is quite unique in his depth of commitment to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Earlier in his career while serving as a senior advisor to the United Nations Global Compact, he was the lead author of the Principles for Responsible Management Education, referred to as PRIME, an initiative that advances sustainable development through management education. He is also the co-founder of the University Global Coalition, a global network of universities working in partnership with the United Nations in support of its sustainable development goals. We also have Drew as well as part of that. Uh, in fact, Georgia Tech's SDG Action and Awareness Week is an activity of the University Global Coalition that's happening this week. The panel President Cabrera is moderating today is based on his newest co-edited book, which you cut right, is called Higher Education and SDG 17, Partnerships for the Goals. The panelists are contributors to the chapter in his book, which tells the story of how the Drawdown Georgia Initiative started and its early successes. So, President Cabrera, would you like to take a seat? Am I, oh. intro you're introducing everybody? I'm introducing everyone. Perfect, all right, then I'll sit here. There we go, here is fun. That's perfect. Good. So the panelists we have are John Lanier, who's executive director of Racy Anderson Foundation. Thank you, John. John, thank you for being here. We have Marilyn Brown, Regents and Brooks Byers Professor, professor of Sustainable Systems in the School of Public Policy. Yeah, Thanks, man. Marilyn. Uh, Michael Oxman, Managing Director for Racy Anderson Center for Sustainable Business. Thanks, Michael. And Beryl Takte, Regents Professor and Professor of Operations Manager Management at Scheller College of Business. So welcome, everyone, and I will turn it over to you, President Cabrera. Right. Thank Let's you, start. Jennifer. Thank you, and thank you all for being being part of this. And um, it is exciting to have at least one one week a year that we, um, in a way, uh, channel our energies to convey the message to other educators and institutions and students of how important the uh, the Sustainable Development Goals are. And um, uh, just as a, as, a, as a little bit of a context, although I feel like I'm, uh, I'm probably preaching to the choir given the line of work of many of the people in the room that I, I recognize, the Sustainable Development Goals are in a way uh, the, the, the strategic framework for the world. All of our uh, countries in, in the world agreed uh, that these are a, a set of uh, 17 areas that we need to get, we need to solve, we need to figure out. We, the global we, all of us, human beings. And uh, the way they were presented was not as in nice, nice things to have, but as must-haves. Like these are the, the things we need to resolve if we're gonna have the opportunity to live uh, good, productive, healthy, peaceful lives around the world and not uh, destroy the only one planet that we uh, can live in. So that, that is, that is uh, the, in a nutshell, uh, what the Sustainable Development Goals represent. And there is one, there are 16 goals, and you know, there, you can, if each of us had to write those goals, maybe we would have come up with different headings and different numbers, but uh, so it is, we have 17. But 16 deal with specific areas of human existence or of health, planetary health. And there is one at the end, uh, goal 17, that says, oh, by the way, if we are to achieve any of the other 16 things, we better start partnering effectively and productively because there's no way only one type of organization can uh, achieve these goals. We need government, we need business, we need academia, we need nonprofit. Uh, we need every actor uh, to, to be able to, uh, to, to sort of uh, join, join forces. And in fact, this is the, the plug, the plug for our book, because uh, it <laughs> has everybody's uh, contributions, is we were recently asked to edit a book, Higher Education and SDG 17. What can universities do to create partnerships that will help us uh, achieve the, the, the goals? And, in fact, we have people here working in the private sector, nonprofit sector. We have people here working, straddling between technology and policy. We have people here um, who are experts in, in business, business education, and what business can do. So, so 
I think this is a good example. And um, in, in not only a good example in terms of your profiles, but also in terms of specific projects that you have, uh, that you have led. But um, since uh, three of the panelists work here, and you may know them better, and one doesn't, I'm going to ask you to give us a little bit of background about um, you run the Racy Anderson Foundation. Racy was uh, a, a proud alum of Georgia Tech and uh, a very interesting business leader with a very interesting business philosophy, especially at the time that he led. Tell us about your granddad. Mm. Happy to. Thank you, President Cabrera, and, and hello, everyone. It's my favorite story to tell. <laughs> Ray Anderson founded Interface, a carpet tile manufacturing company, and he grew it to be a, a $600 million business by 1994. But that was the year that he read a book called The Ecology of Commerce that changed his life because the book said that businesses like his, in particular industrial manufacturing companies like his, were responsible for the vast amount of environmental degradation that the world has ever seen. But they're also the only sector large enough, well enough organized and capitalized to take the necessary leadership role to solve the environmental challenges that our world was facing and still is. And so uh, after reading that book, Ray committed to taking his large multinational publicly traded industrial manufacturing company headquartered right here in Georgia transform it into a prototype of a, a responsible business, one that did right by the planet. He worked to pioneer the prototypical company of the 21st century, one that was truly authentically sustainable. And that company interfaces come a long way. We get to hear later today from the CEO, Laurel Hurd, of, of all that has happened in the time since my grandfather had this epiphany. But for us, the, the family, and I want to acknowledge Jamie Lanier, one of the trustees of the Ray C. Anderson Foundation, and somebody who walked the path with Ray Anderson because he was over 30 years working for the company. When he passed away, he left his family the opportunity to live his legacy, to be a part of helping to advance it, move it forward. And our work as a family of philanthropists, grant makers, supporting environmental sustainability, has been an incredible honor. We've been at it for um, about 13 years now, and in that time, we found that partnership is key. That's true, I think, of philanthropy in general, but we, what we found with uh, Ray Anderson's name on our letterhead, partnership with this institute, his beloved alma mater, has just been one of the smartest things that we could possibly do. Well, thank you, and, and um and I think it makes sense that I, I ask uh, Beryl to follow up and tell us what it is that Georgia Tech, one, the, the very first thing we did with uh, the help of the uh, Ray C. Anderson Foundation. Talk about a partnership. Hello? Yeah, that works. Um, I think the connection between the foundation and Georgia Tech predates maybe what we did together, right? The Anderson Interface Chair uh, which is in industrial systems, was probably the first uh, gift that um, the foundation did at Georgia Tech. That was while Ray was still living. But um, basically the story is, and I told it also last week, um, when the foundation at the beginning was um, exploring how they should steward this gift that Ray left them, uh, which is basically the family, that's the trustees, it's a family foundation. Um, one of the universities they came to was Georgia Tech, and uh, they distributed an RFP with uh, you know, trying to elicit some ideas. And so this came across my desk, and this was at a time where um, I had just perhaps six months prior to that pitched to the dean of the Scheller College of Business at the time that um, the Scheller College had grown organically to have people doing sustainability work in all disciplines, that Georgia Tech at large was a strong sustainability leader, and that if we had an academic initiative or a center in sustainable business, we could really elevate what we did in Scheller College, increase our impact, and also have stronger connections to Georgia Tech and have together more impact. So when this came across my desk, I thought, oh my god, this is just an amazing opportunity because what we can do is, we, yes, we can um, you know, achieve what we want to achieve, but at the same time, what we would be doing is honoring one of Georgia Tech 
um, Georgia Tech's, actually probably Georgia Tech's biggest sustainable business leader, one who had been on, the, on President Clinton's, actually who had co-chaired President Clinton's climate task force. Um, if we start a center here, grounded in uh, the Scheller College of Business, but with the aim of collaborating all across the university, that will be a wonderful way to honor his legacy and have it live on, to educate the Racy Andersons of tomorrow. So that is how the center was created, and its first initiative actually was the creation of Serve, Learn, Sustain, uh, which was um, something that did touch all colleges immediately, and that uh, we're very proud of, among other accomplishments. Thank you, thank you, Vera. Uh, what is, um, in a way, this is the best kind of gift mm -hmm. that, because it's not just the, res it not only came with the resources that allowed us to do important work, but it came also with the, the name and the values that came with that and the inspiration that came with the gift. So, um, so we're much, much appreciative. So um, let me, and I'll get back to you in a minute, uh, Beryl and, and, and Michael about that, but I, I want maybe to ask uh, um, uh, Professor Brown to uh, help explain what Drawdown Georgia came about. And, and, and just to put it in perspective, what, I, what I'm very intrigued by this, this project that you're about to, to learn uh, about is that we have faculty who are not just studying and analyzing uh, the problems that we experience and how some technologies may or may not help but who are motivated to actually enacting solutions. And I think this is a great e example of not just technology meet policy, but meet action. So tell us about Drawdown Georgia, if you don't mind. All right. Uh, well, it uh, began following. Drawdown Georgia was born after a number of visioning meetings that occurred uh, largely on, on campus. Thanks very much for the privilege for that, uh, but we brought in people from many organizations across Georgia to ask what we could do. How could we help tackle climate change? There were no organized efforts. There was no roadmap. There were plenty of international and national studies that had suggested what should be done, but you know, what should Georgia do? What's best for this state? Um, so we held a variety of meetings and conferences, and we got some funding, and it was very uh, Im important, the seed money that uh, the Basie Anderson Foundation provided across campus and across universities. So we started off in partnership with what I consider to be the uh, very strong universities in Georgia. So that would be Emory University of Georgia and Georgia, and Georgia Tech. We added Georgia State, we added Clemson, we, I'm sorry, we added um, uh, Morehouse and um, we've added the Atlanta Municipal uh, Community College. We have reached out then to nonprofits, such as community organizations like South Space and the um, uh, GreenLink Analytics Company. So we have really become kind of an octopus, <laughs> where you know everyone is somehow engaged. It has a need to. We need to engage them because we have got to uh, understand the value of alternative approaches. We took a scientific um, methodology to identify what measures would be most impactful, most cost effective, and most acceptable to people in Georgia. And we reduced a list of 100 from Project Drawdown, which is an international effort, to 20 for Georgia. And these are near-term solutions. By definition, they had to be able to make a $1 million, $1 million ton uh, reduction in CO2 emissions by the year 2030. So uh, we were looking at things that you could imagine, uh, you know, where, you, where you might buy them and um, who might buy them. You know, we did a whole analysis of the market and market opportunities, competitors. Would a solar water heater uh, outperform a heat pump water heater? No. So it got dropped and the heat pump you know, technology was retained. So it was very complicated using the best of analytic approaches that had been previously tested in the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change and in um, US National Laboratory Studies. We brought all of that together. So everyone was measuring along the, using the same metrics. 
so that we could then put this story together and arrive at this distilled list of, of 20 solutions. So that was a multi-year task and very complicated and very inclusive and very much partnership oriented. Mm -hmm. And uh, speaking of partnership, and um, let me ask first Beryl and Michael, then you can follow up, but a big piece of that uh, Drawdown Georgia um, uh, project was the, the business compact. Um, what is it and why did we need it? Thank you for that question. Uh, and thank you for your leadership on the SDGs. And we are always, we're immensely grateful to the Racy Anderson Foundation as well for all of the support that you provided for these initiatives. Um, so the compact, the Drawdown Georgia Business Compact, followed the work that Dr. Brown just described, um, where we had these 20 solutions, these 20 solutions for addressing uh, climate mitigation here in the state of Georgia. And uh, based on that, we, we asked ourselves, in conjunction with our center's advisory board, what can we do with the business community to help move these solutions along and to make progress and to really scale them in the state? And uh, what came back after a number of sort of iterations was the formation of a consortia of companies, which we call the Compact. And um, they came together, they, they represent, I mean, let me just add one other thing, but the other thing that was happening at the same time was that you have some of the larger brands that are based here in the state of Georgia had already made some pretty ambitious statements and set some goals about decarbonization. So we, have, we already had the leaders, many of the leaders here in the state. And so what we thought was, how do we bring some of these leaders together with other companies that could, could use some support um, in a way that represents the economy of the state of Georgia? So we wanted to make sure that the, the compact represented that diversity. So now, um, after it launched, the compact launched in October of 2021, we're now up to 64 companies. I'm checking with David Eady, who's been leading, some of the, leading the compact efforts, because every day it's, it could be 65. It could be, you know, it's in the, the numbers keep growing, which is great. So we have 64 companies, some of the largest brands you can think of, uh, some, some very small companies, and then everything in between, across different industry sectors as well. And I'll speak, I can talk later about, uh, if there's time, about some of the initiatives that have come out of the compact. Um, that we're working on with the companies where our center in collaboration with the Ray Anderson Foundation and Dr. Brown, where we're, we're helping to move some of those initiatives along, both in terms of things the business community can do in partnership, but also where can we partner with our students, where can we partner with our, our faculty researchers, and where can we partner beyond with agencies and uh, nonprofits across the state. So we have, we have a so partnership is the word here. Compa it could be the Drawdown Georgia Business Partnership. Um, but we, we went with Compact as, as the label. But it really is a true partnership, and we're, we're really excited with to where it's going to take us. So go, go ahead, either of you, but t and tell us a couple of um, examples of initiatives. Maybe pick, uh, to be technical, pick the coolest ones. The coolest one. Yeah. Well, I don't uh, want to show favorites. Do you want me to which one? Do you want to OK. Or, or well, well, that narrows it down. <laughs> that, yeah, that's just not right, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, you do one, one, one a piece. One a piece. I want there to we go. Go. There we go. Would you like to go first? No, no, go first. Okay, I'll go first. Uh, so, so one of the ones that um, has been very exciting is uh, trying to bring together many of the companies in the state that are looking for more renewable energy, and the objective here is to keep that renewable energy demand and achieving providing the supply that meets that demand here in the state of Georgia. It's great that we can procure wind out of Texas. Um, we don't want to, I mean, that's, that's great. I'm not being critical of it, but we would prefer to have that demand met here in the state of Georgia. So we're looking, so we're pulling together, or have pulled together, a group of companies in the compact that are interested in doing just that. And not only are they interested in, in meeting their own needs, but they recognize that um, through a collective process, a collective procurement process, they may be able to get you know, a better, they may have some more leverage, they may be able to get better prices, they may be able to, to, to uh, bring, it, bring it on in a way that makes sense not only for their indiv individual company but also for the state. So uh, we're doing that through collaboration with the likes of, of Georgia Power as well as some of the EMCs and NEAG Power here, here in the state. And we're looking at other um, uh, transactional mechanisms as well that might facilitate uh, this collective procurement. So. Just one last statistic I'll leave you with, which is um, in assessing 
only about, I said there were 64 companies in the compact, assessing about 15 of them. We aggregated the sort of uh, unmet renewable demand uh, that they need, and it works out to about 200, between 200 and 400 megawatts. And that's only 15 companies, not the whole 64. And that's, that's a huge level of renewable energy demand that we would love to have achieved here in the state of Georgia. So that's one of the initiatives that we have going on. Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for leading that work group. So um, just to go back to what Michael said, there are initiatives at the UN level, at the international level, that bring together companies in uh, these large coalitions or compacts, and they make declarations. And those platforms are really very important to drive the visibility globally, to, to drive um, leadership at the highest levels of companies. But really where all actions happen is local. And of course, many companies are looking um, you know, to South America for reforestation efforts, and um, they're looking at other pa places of the world for um, other solutions that have to do with climate change. But what are we doing here in Georgia? So that was the question behind the Drawdown Georgia Compact. And all of these companies that have made ambitious commitments which of those commitments are they meeting here? And what are the specific you know, regulatory environment? What is the specific political environment? What is the specific workforce requirement? What does the state's plan look like for the next 10 years? Well, right now, as you know, Georgia is one of the states, probably the state that has drawn in the most um, green transportation type of um, funds from, from the federal government in the last couple of years. So looking at all of that in context and bringing, that's the motto of Drawdown Georgia, bringing climate solutions home was the impetus for creating the compact in a way that companies could come together to talk about these issues and address what they could in the pre-competitive stage of their businesses. Obviously, you can't have businesses collude <laughs> on pricing or products, but you can have them come together, surface their common issues, you know, try to develop specific platforms for action and engagement that um, are perfectly legal and, um, like I said, happen at the pre-competitive stage. So that's the idea um, to add to what Michael said about the compact. So one of the others is uh, Georgia-grown forest carbon. Uh, the five categories, so drawdown solutions have five categories, and one of the categories are nature-based solutions. Of course, Georgia is a big agriculture state and a state where forestry is a very important sector, right? So in this particular initiative, we're partnering with the University of Georgia, the Georgia Forestry Foundation, the Georgia Forestry Commission, Nature Conservancy, and others. And the goal is to explore the creation of a voluntary carbon market for high quality, high integrity carbon credits, and these would be achieved through afforestation, reforestation, revegetation, and improved forest management projects. One of the, and then companies that have committed to buying carbon credits as part of their strategy could buy some of those credits in this local voluntary market. One of the characteristics of the compact is that we do want to make sure that um, we look at issues of equity and that we don't only go with the biggest players but also um, the entire range of business owners in Georgia. So it does have a special focus on engaging small acreage forest landowners and underserved forest landowners within the state. Perfect. Thank you. Let, let's, um, <clears throat> based on those examples, let's get a little uh, philosophical. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm going to start with you. So, um, your granddad's company was a publicly traded company. Mm -hmm. So, he had this epiphany and, and this vision, but he was still running a publicly traded company. We had to convince the board of directors and ultimately shareholders that this made sense for the business. Is environmental sustainability good for business? Yes, full stop. Absolutely. That's please, been proven. please explain. It's been proven by the example of Ray Anderson, by the example of Interface, and since then, many other companies. 
Uh, we like to say that Ray proved the business case for sustainability by being the, the first penguin to jump in the water, if you will. He, he showed that the water was safe and it was a better place to be swimming because in brief, there's four things that happen when a company publicly traded, privately held, doesn't matter. But if the company engages authentically in a path towards environmental sustainability, four things happen that improve your bottom line, even if that's not your why for doing it. For Ray, it wasn't about getting as rich as possible. It was about doing the right thing. The four things are that when you pursue sustainability, you become a more efficient enterprise that reduces your costs. That's one of the ways that you can pull the lever on that profit, because profit equals revenue minus cost. And it helps pull that cost down, especially in the long term. The second thing that happened at Interface and then with companies that deeply engage in this is innovation, something that's true to the core of what happens at this institute. When confronted with sustainability challenges, the world is struggling to adapt to the challenges that humanity has introduced. Really smart people respond to that, and they try to solve the challenges around sustainability in new and exciting ways that result in breakthroughs in the corporate context that wouldn't have happened otherwise. The third thing that happens is culture change. Interface was the first carpet manufacturing company to make an authentic commitment towards the earth. You better believe they attracted higher quality talent and the talent that was within the company collaborated across the entire world. If something worked in the Australian manufacturing plant that reduced the environmental impact, it was gonna be replicated in the Netherlands and in the United States. And the last thing that happens is you earn real goodwill in the marketplace. Not every customer is willing to pay more for a green product, but some are. And that makes a difference, especially when you think about gaining market share. Interface was able to gain market share in the relatively early years of their sustainability commitment because it was the architecture and design community that understood the new values and ethos that Ray was espousing. And there were companies that were going to be specking Interface carpet no matter what because they had heard Ray Anderson speak and they knew that he got it. And that is a huge advantage. It meant that Interface was able to outcompete other carpet companies, not on price and quality, though sometimes on those, but on environmental performance. They transformed the paradigm from a race to the bottom in carpet to a race to the top. And that's what we need to see all across every sector. Well, I, you kind of uh, um, killed my next question because I, I was going to, no, you, you did extraordinarily well answering the question. I was going to ask our two business professors, ask them, how do we teach this? And you just gave the master, uh, the master <laughs> class anything to add. How do we, no, and, but, but seriously, how, I mean, the dominant culture in the business school continues to be one based on performance, financial performance, it's how do you introduce these topics uh, into an audience um, that uh, may contain people who are perhaps skeptical mm. about these ideas? Do you want to go first? You can go. I, I would just say that um, when Ray was doing this, he didn't have, he was doing it essentially on his own, right? And when we talk to students now, what we're talking about is not only the leadership that has to take place within a company to make this happen, but the ecosystem around the company that is demanding it. So increasingly, we see customers asking for more sustainable products. We see investors saying it's not just about quarterly earnings and the, those analyst reports. It's about long-term shareholder value. And once you start extending that horizon and thinking about both the risks and opportunities for that business, you're, you're inevitably going to come across environmental and social issues that you may, may not have been traditionally considered as part of the bottom line calculation. So between customers, investors, suppliers, you know, the whole range, the whole entire ecosystem, there, I mean, it, there's pressure now within that to address uh, environmental and social issues, which I think is a benefit that Ray didn't have at the time. We still need company leadership. We still need pioneers who are willing to try new things and innovate. Uh, and as John said, make it, make it commercially uh, attractive. Uh, but that is increasingly easier because you have this, you have this ecosystem support. That would be my two cents. Anything I was add? going to say, you wrote the book on this, so you probably have the answer. But I echo what Michael said. Um, 
you know, I've been, I've been here since 2005 now. Uh, that's a long time. And I, I've noticed that, especially not just in the MBA classes, but the executive education classes, the audience is changing. It's changing from being skeptical to asking the question, okay, we get it now, how do we do it? So um, over time, I think our focus has shifted to, um, in the direction of spending less time making the case and spending more time getting into the specifics of, okay, uh, what are the attributes that you can credibly market on if you're in the marketing field? And how do you put together a, a um, financial plan for a um, new solar array? Or how do you configure your operations globally to make sure that you're sustainable? So, and also, you know, in, in, in keeping with Georgia Tech strategic plan's emphasis, we always have emphasized the practical, so the experiential learning. Uh, Michael, for example, runs a practicum course. We have a series of fellows and ambassadors who um, do some of their own projects, some of them with companies, some of them um, just out of their own um, lived experience. We have something called the Carbon Reduction Challenge, which also it it was the next gen um, in the Ray Anderson Foundation that actually funded the launch of that project where we challenge our students who go on to do internships in companies. On top of your internship, look around, talk to people, and see if you can find a project to reduce carbon emissions, save the company money, create a pitch deck, <laughs> sell it to the administration, and see if you can make headway. So uh, giving students agency and showing them that they can make a difference is also part of the pedagogy. Awesome. So let's talk policy, Marilyn, if that's OK. Yeah. <laughs> So, it be, because all of this is interconnected, right? I mean, if, if, if um, somehow we had policies that placed appropriate pricing on the environmental uh, use of share resources of, of businesses, uh, that would create additional incentives to make it even more rational for businesses to act. Um, where do you see the, um, the most practical, most immediate, potentially most effective policy areas Nationally, but also at the state level. Where do you, where do you see some hope? Um, Easy question. Uh, it was fun until you said at the state level. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've been tracking what's going on in the legislature. They're currently in uh, session. And also the Georgia Public Service Commission has just finished its interim um, integrated resource plan uh, meetings all last week. And uh, you know the policy um, state of affairs is moving very slowly, and it's resulted in a lot of uh, statistics that are concerning. So I know that our our business environment is looking quite optimistic and promising and committed, but this, the facts and figures you know, cause us to pause. We're 43rd in um, the uh, frequency of rooftop solar across the state compared to the. 50 states of the US. Uh, we have fewer heat pumps per household than any of the adjacent states to the state of Georgia. And I can just go on so and on. So we certainly are uh, going to be a good market, because we have not reached pets full saturation of some of these uh, measures that we think have such great promise. We really need the business uh, approach to help move policy because policy on its own is not going to uh, change rapidly. So we, all these partnerships, and of course, you've got to have the facts and figures from the academics to be able to back up uh, any of the argumentation you make about the need for policy change. There's a lot of, of, uh, of uh, proposals being debated that weren't on the um, docket a few years ago. So there is some movement. Uh, but uh, for instance, um, as you might know, the current proposal is to not shut down our coal, to import more natural gas from other states, to build single cycle diesel units because we have such growth, because we are such a winner in the green tech economy. We're building so much in the state of Georgia that presumably we need more electricity. However, the role of the consumer is not being considered. And the consumer includes 
the large companies that are making these goods, they should be able to own and operate <clears throat> their on uh, location renewable resources and feed it into the grid, but you can't do that in the state of Georgia. Um, so we, there's so much opportunity for us all to work together to uh, make changes that will change and the, the statistics that right now don't look very attractive. Uh, thank you. Let me, so please, uh, I, I will uh, take some questions. So be thinking about what questions you want to ask, and I hope maybe there's a microphone somewhere. If not, we'll, we'll repeat the questions for the video. But, uh, perfect. But um, before that, I want to turn the attention to our own business, the business of Georgia Tech, our teaching, our research, our operations. Suppose that you are advising the president of this esteemed institution, uh, and suppose the esteemed the president of this esteemed institution had all the magic powers to enact uh, uh, your ideas. Um, what would you recommend? What can Georgia Tech do more of um, uh, to accelerate these trends in a positive way? have things to contribute to from there as co-chair of Sustainability Next, but um, certainly leading by example is one of the things that uh, is central to the overall Georgia Tech plan and should be also in this case. The climate action plan that is on the table right now is very ambitious. So, and, and as are some of the other plans that have been developed, there's a vulnerability assessment that looks at how Georgia Tech can become more resilient. Um, there is also things that reach into the community. Georgia Tech is an anchor institution. So what do we do in terms of our hiring practices, what do we do in terms of our um, transportation on and off campus, our uh, water management on campus, our procurement, uh, which of course is um, in the context of state procurement policies, I guess, uh, you know, coming back to some of Maryland's uh, points more broadly. So I guess, on the one hand, we would invite a very serious um, investment by looking at perhaps public-private partnerships, looking at creative measures to move on leading by example on campus. And all across the institution, there is um, so much excellence in research and teaching that um, I think we've pitched the idea that climate, sustainability, and energy um, as a campaign priority could do amazing things to move the needle on how much more we can do in research and education. So I guess that would be the second thing on the wish list um, to really accelerate our efforts as part of the uh, Georgia Tech campaign for tomorrow to, um, to, to elevate and accelerate the work of all these wonderful people here and elsewhere on campus. Thank you. And you're already doing a lot of that, so thank you. Can I speak to what else? I want yeah, to, yeah, I want to speak is, to the, what you're doing. This is for all of you. Um, I, I watched this man sit on stage next to Ed Bastian, CEO of Delta, in front of the Atlanta Press Club, all journalists. And he said the words, when I was reading the IPCC report, <laughs> and he meant it, President of Georgia Tech, well-versed in the latest climate science, willing to talk about it on stage in a very public forum with journalists invited. They were hosting the thing. That means something. We're at a point now where the, the conversation around climate has shifted. It's shifted from is it real to what are we going to do about it? And there's very real discourse around that question. But part of that transition is the willingness for the issue of climate to be discussed confidently by people in leadership positions like yourself. You sitting here today talking about climate, you going out and speaking about Georgia Tech's leadership because people like Marilyn Brown are world-renowned experts in their field. And you can say, look at what Georgia Tech's doing in this space. It signals something. Keep talking, keep signaling, keep getting out there because it's making a difference within the state and beyond. I believe Georgia can be the leading state on climate solutions in the country. If climate happens here, it means more than if it happens in California, for reasons that I think everyone understands. And it will happen 
more and more with leadership of people like you. It's been tremendous to have you. I, this was all about I you guys, but I... Uh, you but were nice I, to I, me, I had to I, be I, nice I, to I, you. No, yeah, <laughs> thank you, thank you. That, no, I take in a good note of that, and I appreciate it. More ideas for uh, Georgia Tech. Well, um, I mean, our students are the, are the solution. So I've, I've been teaching energy technology and policy with Valerie Thomas from ISYE for 17 years now. It's my 17th time. And each time we always uh, have our students who come from uh, 33 students this year, half or more engineers and the rest from all across campus, including public policy. We always have them work on practical uh, projects, which puts their engineering to work in making an assessment of uh, sustainability solutions. And this year, we had them evaluate the measures under consideration by the State Department of Natural Resources for its climate action plan. The first climate action plan that will ever have been developed by the state of Georgia and will be submitted this week to the US EPA. And my 33 students contributed to the appendix and did modeling That's pretty cool. of measures, put them through a, a, a simulator built by the uh, Rocky Mountain Institute called the Energy Policy Simulator. So there are now um, about 21 um, measures that the state has agreed to go forward on over the next uh, several years, and that $4.5 billion will be spent to support them across the U.S. over the next several years. The competition is open uh, for business now. The decisions will be made on grants, $4.5 billion. By, you know, the proposals are due April 1. Decisions will be made shortly thereafter, and that money will be unleashed. So we will have much more activity in terms of availability of um, solutions on the ground, making a difference here very shortly. Uh, you know, not because of decisions made by policymakers here in the state, but because they agreed to participate in the national program. Not every state did. Three states elected not to participate in taking um, and developing a climate action plan and being available then to obtain uh, funds from EPA. So yay, we, we mm -hmm. stepped up and looking forward to that. And our students have been so instrumental. That's great. That's a great example. That's awesome. Thank you. Michael, you, any, anything you want to add to the list? I'd also like to compliment your leadership of being fourth in line. It might, it might not come across as genuine, uh, <laughs> but I do. It is genuine. In any case, uh, I, would, I would just add the following, that um, uh, I, I agree with the, the, the notion that our students are our future. Uh, I think that the experiential learning that we provide is critical. It's one thing to... When I'm in the classroom and waving my arms about sustainability, that you know, it, it might be interesting to some and boring to others. But if if we have a something that they can contribute to that is very concrete, this is you know, this is how we figure it out for this particular organization, the nuts and bolts. That's when you see light bulbs go off, at least from an educational perspective. The other thing I, I think we have an opportunity as I mean, since we are such a well-respected institution, to um, take some of all of these different initiatives and find ways to scale both scale the learning, scale the research, scale the connections between uh, business and researchers to help to the, the, one of the reasons the compact was successful, frankly, is because of our, our brand, right? We, we're seen as a trusted, neutral convener. We can't do the work for the companies, but we can bring them together. We can bring them to the table. So having that, that's, that set of assets and others across campus collaborate in a transdisciplinary way so that we're addressing both the environmental issues and the social issues, I think gives us, it gives us an immense opportunity going forward. Awesome. Thank you. Raise your hand and a microphone will find you, <laughs> even if you are in the middle of the row. Well, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, While they're uh, doing the microphone, can I just jump in and say one thing? Um, the plan that Marilyn talked about, what the state put in, actually they're using as their baseline the um, emissions assessment and the emissions tracker that Marilyn and her team developed as the first stage of uh, Drawdown Georgia. So that's, that's awesome. uh, been really awesome. Work with yeah. real impact. Please. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you all, uh, your leadership in different dimensions. Um, uh, I would like to... Uh, push you in a somewhat different also in SDG, uh, SDG 12. 
uh, which is responsible consumption. Okay. Uh, Georgia Tech uh, attract a lot of very well-off students. Uh, I heard from admissions. Uh, very, very well-off. Uh, you probably do know. Uh, so I actually talked to Valerie Thomas. Uh, she agreed. Uh, if it does enough uh, life cycle assessment, you find as a rich country, uh, where educational institution, the biggest impact we can make maybe is the responsible consumption. Right. We consume responsibly. The environmental footprint reduced tremendously. It's not a little bit, right? Uh, so as educational institution, so what's only what's research. The question, the how question is how we do that, that part, that take is, leadership okay. for All right. the world. Any, any thoughts? Because I guess to your point earlier, John, thank you for that question. To your point earlier, if more consumers put uh, sustainability of the products as one of their top dimensions, I think that would create immediate incentives. Um, but not everybody. So is there anything you think we can do as an institution to encourage responsible consumption? I might jump in and uh, say, well, there's certain things you can break it down into, right? Um, one is energy efficiency, and we've talked at length about that. So um, energy efficiency is perhaps not need, seen as a cool new technology, but it is <laughs> a very important part of being able to, um, I think, um, produce and consume responsibly. The second one is circular economy, so the, the old reduce, reuse, recycle, remanufacture. That's actually my research area, so close to my heart. I guess um, we could do a better job on campus of creating opportunities for students to buy from each other. Each time that they move out from dorms, we could have, I think Brent had this idea, like, to have a hands-on workshop to teach them how to uh, even repair small appliances so that you can keep using them. Just uh, increasing that, um, um, both the ethos and uh, capabilities for circular economy would be another thing. That's a great, great idea. Thank you. Thank you all again for being here and, and talking. We've talked a bit about Drawdown Georgia, but for the sake of maybe the audience, could you give an outline of what it is overall and its goals and in the time frame of those goals? John. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Uh, Drawdown Georgia is an initiative meant to bring many people into the work of climate solutions scaling in the state of Georgia. Research is the backbone. 20 high impact climate solutions across the five sectors of transportation, electricity, food and agriculture, land sinks, buildings and materials. And we know that over the next seven years through 2030, that the state of Georgia has the ability to reduce its annual carbon footprint by 50% compared to a 2006 baseline year. So when you look at what can be done this decade, we see that there's an opportunity for Georgia to achieve significant carbon reduction, setting itself up for over the following two decades, the path towards a carbon neutral Georgia in accordance with the Paris Climate Accord. But the work, the work is rooted in partnership because if you just have research saying what's possible, and nobody who's taken the responsibility to actually doing that work, to turning the theoretical into the real, then it will just be an interesting research project. And so that's really what the ethos is around the various things that we've been speaking about. Everything we've spoken about up here falls within the Drawdown Georgia ecosystem. And it goes even beyond what we've been able to touch on today. Uh, so I think we are beginning to see the, the theory of change be realized that Georgia has a leaderful movement in favor of climate solutions. We're all a part of it. That's great. I'm going to say we've one not, We've not talked okay. about much about uh, the role of equity and inclusion mm -hmm. yet, Thank but that's you, been a cornerstone. And uh, we've tried to make that also a feature of how we conduct the research. Mm -hmm. So get, getting multi, you know, many views and looking at uh, how all would, will be impacted, all, all elements of society, has been a continuing focus and very rewarding. And valuable and a priority for the compact as well yeah. Perfect. one last question because then I'm going to ask you to wrap up with one quick quick uh, question which you 
they'll know what I'm going to ask. <laughs> How lucky am I to get the last question? So thank you all so much for your leadership. And Marilyn, thank you for um, prioritizing equity and inclusion and all of you and the work that we're doing in Georgia. So I think some of you know that um, that I worked for a large, very large fashion company for several years. And I do want to say that one of Michael's students um, did a wonderful job with the project, helping us figure out how to get rid of coal in our supply chain. So I can't um, speak highly enough about the students at Georgia Tech. Um, but my question relates to thinking about the business compact. So we had a global fashion compact called the Fashion Charter, which is an initiative of the UN. And that collaborative effort was so important. Number one, for the collective action projects that you all are talking about, including trying to change public policy in Asia, in different countries that we were working. Um, but number two, I would say the most important role was accountability, because you had these big companies, big brands making these big commitments, but there needed to be somebody holding them accountable for those commitments. And that is so important, and transparency is so important. So can you speak to that? I should know the answer to this, but I don't, to what the accountability aspects are of the business compact. Can I take that? Sure. So um, it's, there's, a, there's a lot to that, Judy, but I would say my initial response would be we have, there's four activity areas that we have going within the compact. Um, one is facilitating collaboration on some of the initiatives that we talked about. The second is catalyzing innovation. So working with startups and bringing solutions to some of the larger buyers. Uh, and then the, uh, the third is um, creating a community of practice where we learn from each other. And the final one, I'm getting to the final one, which is reporting on progress. And it just so happens that you're, the timing of your question is very good because we're having a meeting, an all-hands meeting coming up here in a few weeks, right, David? Um, Mar March 27th. Uh, with our compact members uh, being hosted by Slalom, where we are specifically going to dive into the specifics of that. Because, as you know, well know, the individual companies that are part of the compact, many of them have some very ambitious decarbonization and other SDG-related goals. Um, and they've come under a lot of scrutiny as to whether these things are really meaningful and whether they're actually going to be able to execute all the way through the last mile. And so we want to make absolutely sure that the compact has a, mech has a system for reporting on progress as well as for reporting on the individual contributions that companies are making you know, on their own within their own respective organizations. So that is the focus, to make sure that we are, in fact, holding the compact ourselves and that the individual companies are looking, they're learning from each other as to how to do the reporting. Because the reporting can also be, you know, yeah. um, it's, it's critically important and it can be very complicated. Yeah. So we want to make sure that the smaller companies have those resources to do the reporting and that they're contributing to the compact as well as the larger companies, you know, sort of mentoring them along the way. That's a partial answer to your question. That's great. So this is my, um, I, I want just a quick, quick answer because uh, I cannot send you uh, uh, home fully depressed. If you're not alarmed enough about this situation, just read the IPCC uh, yep. report. Uh, that's uh, really sobering. <laughs> But I, I want to end with hope. What brings you hope that we can meet the challenge? Real quick. In any particular, no particular order. Unless I need to start cold calling. My five-year-old came home from school and said, Daddy, did you know that it's really important we keep as many trees as we can because they pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere? Awesome. Kindergarten. They awesome. get it. <laughs> that, that's an answer. That's an answer in and of itself. A little depressing, but go, 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 go ahead, Michael. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, Marilyn gives me hope. How's that? No. Uh, I would actually she does, but I would say that our students and uh, you know, particularly when they ask questions that I can't answer about sustainability, because they're really diving in, they're really committed. They want it, and they need to talk to a, a an, an expert on that particular thing. Um, it just, it's energizing because they recognize how urgent these issues are and they're hungry for solutions. So it's a privilege to be able to at least facilitate that process. That gives me hope. Meryl. Oh, stole my thunder. Oh. So, <laughs> not thunder, but anyway. Students, definitely. I mean, as educators, that really matters. But so I'll add and I'll say partnerships. 
and I see here many partners from within and outside Georgia Tech in the room, and it's, it's uh, the energy that I get from those partnerships that gives me the, the fuel I need. So thank you all. So some of the numbers don't look so bad. Um, we've now eliminated the very worst of the international forecasts for CO2 emissions and concentrations from the uh, forecasts of, that are being debated now. So we're not going to go up 6 or 10 degrees C uh, by the end of the century. And so I'm, I'm very happy we've been making some progress. We have. Uh, some of the numbers show that our um, CO2 per capita in the U.S. is down. And I attribute that mostly to efficiency. And we're using better goods and services that are made um, more uh, sustainably and are consumed with greater uh, appreciation uh, for their impact on the environment. So we are we are seeing little little bits of progress, and we really need to flag them, highlight them, so that we can celebrate uh, and and uh, accelerate. Well, I thank you all, and the, 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 actually the, this conversation, the four of you, bring me hope um, to, to really uh, work at an institution where we are surrounded by um, not just smart uh, people, but people who are committed to um, improving the human condition, and that includes, very importantly, to take care of the only planet that we can inhabit. So um, uh, thank you. Thank you for the conversation today, and more importantly, thank you for your leadership on campus and beyond. Thank you. Thank you.